Gallienus was the longest reigning of any 3rd century emperor. No small feat in and of itself, and in my estimation, clearly one of the best emperors Rome ever had. He was forced to march from one theatre of war to another, either defeating a usurper or checking barbarian incursions. He reigned during the most tumultuous times of the 3rd century, yet he was able to defend the empire time and time again. But as he was constantly on the move, putting out fires, he didn't have a master plan to mend the empire from the crisis it found itself in. But many of his ad hoc measures proved to be effective, especially his cavalry corps. His reputation has been somewhat sullied by the fact he was unable to prevent the secession of important provinces of the empire. Any video on Gallienus and most of the 3rd century emperors must be prefaced by an understanding that our historical sources are incomplete, fragmentary, and not wholly trustworthy. A reconstruction of his reign will, therefore, always be to some degree speculative. First Couple of Years Publius Licinius Ignatius Gallienus was born circa 218 into an upper-class Roman family with its roots in Eturia. He was elevated to the imperial throne by his father, who came to power following a brief civil war between Emperor Trebonius Gallus against the usurper Aemilianus. Gallus had summoned Valerian, who was commanding troops on the Upper Rhine at the time, to bring reinforcements. Gallus was killed by his soldiers before Valerian could arrive. As a result, Valerian's troops proclaimed him emperor, and marched towards Aemilianus, who himself was slain by his troops, making Valerian undisputed emperor of Rome. His first act as emperor was to elevate Gallienus as his imperial partner on the 22nd of October 253. Gallienus was already married to Cornelia Salonia upon his ascension, and they had three sons, Valerianus, Saloninus, and Marinianus. The father and son duo of Valerian and Gallienus divided responsibilities geographically. Gallienus would be in charge of the Rhine and Danube frontiers, and Valerian would control the east and conduct the long overdue war against Sassanid Persia. Sharper, the Persian king, had invaded the Roman East with impunity in recent years. In 254, they launched the year as co-consuls. Whether they were in Rome or had already left is not known. Perhaps Gallienus escorted the troops his father had removed from the Upper Rhine back to that region, and Valerian might have been escorted by the troops Aemilianus had removed from the Danube upon his own march on Rome in the previous year. Either way, we do know that Gallienus eventually ended up on the Danube, a region that had seen numerous invasions and usurpations in recent years, and the legions seemed to have been restless ever since the reign of Maximinus Thrax. In fact, the last three emperors had been elevated by the Danubian legions, and the powerful commanders did not like Gallienus, whom they saw as an effeminate intellectual and not a military man. But Gallienus soon won their approval after a series of victories over the Germans and the Carpi. Unfortunately, our sources don't give us much information about these victories, but it seems Gallienus established himself well in the Balkans. He had, presumably, seen the shortcomings that the frontiers possessed. It consisted of one line of defence of, mainly, slow-moving heavy infantry. So, if and when that line had been penetrated, the provinces lay wide open for plundering. Gallienus began recruitment of a new cavalry corps that would be able to respond quickly and move to intercept any breach of the frontier. He recruited horsemen from the Balkans of both heavy lancers and mounted archers. This would become his own personal army, and as it was a mounted army, it meant he could move quickly and respond to emergencies as they appeared. The new cavalry was to be stationed close to the frontier, but not on it. In the Balkans, it was stationed in Siscia, and on the Rhine in Augusta Trevororum. This meant that if the frontier was breached, the cavalry would be able to deal with the incursion without removing most of the troops that were protecting the frontier, a sort of in-depth defence that would reinforce the outer shell of frontier forts and walls around the empire. 
In 255, Gallienus launched the year in Rome as consul with his father, who presumably was absent from the capital, still fighting in the east, and Gallienus himself was soon back on the frontier again, as he made Viminacium his base. He crushed an invading army from the Sarmatians, and possibly an incursion of the Quadi. In late 255, he hurried to protect the Rhine frontier against the Franks and the Alemanni. He left a certain Crinitius in charge in the Balkans while he was away. Gallienus tried to prevent the enemy from crossing the Rhine, but they managed to get across, and he engaged them in battle and won. It's clear that Gallienus was heavily outnumbered as he faced two powerful confederations concurrently. The threat might have been so big that it was thought to have required the presence of both emperors, and indeed inscriptions place his father Valerian at Colonia Agrippinensis in August of 256. Valerian had moved to the Balkans when Crinitius had fallen ill to reorganize the frontier's defenses. Valerian had also appointed Claudius, the future emperor, as the replacement for Crinitius in the Balkans before he himself had set off for the Rhine frontier. The imperial partners met at Colonia Agrippinensis to discuss the future division of the empire and how to manage the many threats along the borders. Gallienus would take charge of Italy and the Rhine frontier, and Gallienus's eldest son, Valerianus II, would act as an imperial figurehead in the Balkans to prevent generals from proclaiming themselves emperor with an imperial family member so close at hand. We don't know how old Valerianus II was, but he was placed under the tutelage of a man called Ingenuus. Gallienus's wife, Salonina reportedly said that she distrusted the expression on the face of Ingenuus, and as we will see, her suspicion was not misplaced. Ingenuus also replaced Claudius as ducks of the Balkan frontiers. Claudius himself was sent to Gaul with reinforcements to Gallienus. Many of the border cities on the Rhine, such as Augusta Trevororum, Novatium, and Agrippinensis seem to have been fortified during this period with new stone walls. In early 257, Gallienus and Valerian were both in Rome, and were once again co-consuls for the year. That's also when Valerian issued the edict that would lead to the persecution of the Christians before he set off for the east. Gordian III had disbanded the only legion stationed in Africa, Legio III Augusta, when he became emperor. The legion had been instrumental in the defeat of his grandfather and uncle, Gordian I and II. With the main military deterrent in the area removed, the Moors had pushed the Roman frontiers in Africa and settled some border regions. Gallienus reconstituted the legion, and it was garrisoned in Africa once again, and in the 250s, the area saw hostilities as Rome sought to recapture lost territory. Usurpers and Tragedy During 257 and 258, Ingenuus seems to have been very successful in his defence of the Danubian frontier. In 258, he allegedly feared that he had become too successful and that the emperors would soon have him removed. Whether that was true or not, ultimately doesn't matter, as Ingenuus proclaimed himself emperor in 258, but the fact that he didn't even have time to mint his own coins before Gallienus attacked suggests that the emperor had been informed of Ingenuus's plan beforehand. Valerianus II, Gallienus's son, was murdered by Ingenuus when he proclaimed himself emperor. Before departing, Gallienus seems to have sent his other son, Saloninus, to Gaul under the protection of Silvanus, the Praetorian Prefect, and Posthumus, the future emperor of the breakaway empire of Gaul, and was made ducks of the Rhine frontier. Exactly where Gallienus's army met with Ingenuus's is unknown, but somewhere close to Sirmium, perhaps close to the crossroads at Mercia. Ingenuus's army proved to be ill-prepared to deal with Gallienus's heavy shock cavalry, and his army collapsed almost immediately after the initial charge. Ingenuus died following the battle. The future Emperor Claudius is said to have distinguished himself during the battle. When Gallienus inquired the soldiers about the health of Claudius, who apparently was injured during the battle, the soldier replied that he, Claudius, had fought like Achilles. 
After the battle, Gallienus was furious. His eldest son had been killed, and he clamoured for revenge. He ordered his officers to kill every male in the vicinity of the battle, young and old, soldier and civilian alike. This would also serve as a stark warning for any future potential usurper. However, during the winter of 258 to 259, the Sarmatians, probably the Roxolani, crossed the frozen Danube to invade Roman territory. The man who replaced Ingenuus as the overall commander of the Danube was Regalianus, who scored a number of smashing victories against the incursion. He had inherited much of his army from Ingenuus, and now with a couple of victories behind them, they proclaimed Regalianus emperor. The exact timing of this revolt is unknown, and we don't know Gallienus's whereabouts at the time, but sometime during 259 seems to be likely. Gallienus had perhaps moved to the Rhine following the Ingenuus revolt. Either way, Regalianus was soon killed by his own men, who perhaps feared Gallienus's harsh treatment that followed Ingenuus's revolt. Gallienus marched back to the Danube to once again reorganize the defenses and install a new commander the future emperor, Probus. With the two revolts in the area in a very short time, Gallienus did something unprecedented. He took a second wife and married Pippa, who was the daughter of Attalus, the chieftain of the Marcomanni tribe. But due to the state of our sources, it might have been the daughter of the king of the Jathungi tribe, as our sources often seem to confuse the two tribes. The reason for this marriage has long been debated, but Gallienus was not a traditionalist, he was an innovator. This marriage brought him an ally in a region that had seen numerous revolts and invasions in recent decades. He hoped that this would give any potential usurpers second thoughts with an ally to the emperor so close at hand. It seems Gallienus's wife, Salonina, approved, or at least tolerated, his new wife. It also appears that the Marcomanni were allowed to settle in Roman territory, probably in one of the Pannonian provinces, and they were tasked with defending the frontier. During his time in the Balkans, he received news of another invasion by the Franks and the Alemanni into Gaul. He force-marched back to Gaul in the late summer of 259, where he defended Roman territory. Valerian's Campaign Meanwhile, in the east, Valerian's campaign against Shapur ended catastrophically, as the emperor was captured by the Persians while negotiating peace after a devastating defeat of his forces, which left the entire eastern part of the empire wide open to Persian aggression. And Shapur exploited Roman weakness to the fullest. He dispersed his army, and altogether they captured 36 cities. But the Persians proved to be too greedy. Weighed down by the huge amount of booty, and their army divided, they were unable to resist the regrouped Romans. The Romans had quickly reformed into four different army groups. Chief of these groups was led by Odinathus, the Arab king of Palmyra and Roman senator, who proved to be very successful in crushing the Persian armies. One of our sources for this period is the 6th century historian Zosimus, who wrote that Odinathus was pursuing them as far as Stesiphon, not once but twice he shut the Persians up in their own city so that they were glad to save their children, wives and selves, while he restored order in the lands already pillaged as far as he could. Odinathus made it clear from the very beginning that he was Gallienus's general, and he did not have any imperial ambitions himself, and it appears that he actually defeated Ballista, who had led one of the other regrouped Roman armies on the order of Gallienus. Gallienus bestowed the titles Corrector Totius Orientus, Dux Romanum, and Imperator upon Odinathus, and celebrated his victories as his own. The Years of Crisis During his time in the Balkans, the Franks broke through the frontier on the Lower Rhine in a massive raid that reached as far as Tarraconensis in Spain. It appears that some of them commandeered ships and raided northern Africa, and it appears that some of them established a base there, from which they raided much of the western Mediterranean for the coming decade. When Gallienus was doing his best defending Gaul, the Alemanni and Jathungi broke through the frontier on the Upper Rhine and invaded Italy. These many invasions 
were not massive hordes of barbarians all marching together in a professional army. Instead, we have to think of these invasions as large warbands that operated somewhat independently from each other. These were not necessarily wars of conquest, but rather large-scale raids to plunder the rich imperial land. With that said, one of these warbands reached as far as the imperial capital. The panicked senate quickly armed as many citizens, praetorians and ex-soldiers as they could muster, and it appears that the force gathered terrified the outnumbered barbarians who rapidly retreated. The Eternal City was saved, but Italy suffered severely as the Alamanni and Jathungi withdrew. Cities were plundered and devastated, and some were left completely depopulated. In early spring of 260, Gallienus arrived in Italy with a small cavalry army consisting of around 10,000 horses. One historian claims that Gallienus killed 300,000 Alamanni and Jathungi in a battle close to Mediolanum, Though the number of 300,000 on face value seems absurd, the modern historian Ica Sivan considers it plausible and argues that Gallienus engaged several camps separately, each consisting of perhaps 20 to 30,000 men. The initial surprise attack against a couple of these camps could have caused the Alemanni to flee in panic towards the next camp, as the Romans were already advancing towards it. Sivan goes on and argues that this could have caused a domino effect and a wholesale rout of several or all of these separate warbands, and Gallienus's elite cavalry would have made an easy show of the fleeing Alemanni. The Jathungi had apparently already retreated across the Alps, where they were met by the governor of Raetia, who had gathered a force from the Rhine garrisons. The governor won a smashing victory and liberated thousands of Italians. Gallienus established a peace treaty with the Jathungi and the Alemanni, where Rome would pay the tribes, and in return, they would provide soldiers whenever required. A sensible arrangement that would alleviate the manpower shortage the Empire suffered from following the numerous wars and plagues in recent decades. However, Gallienus could not rest on his laurels for long. In the summer of 260, Posthumus revolted in Gaul. The provinces of Gaul had suffered tremendously following the invasion of the Franks and Alemanni. Gallienus had left the province to its fate when he marched to defend Italy. Gallienus's son, Saloninus, was still in Colonia Agrippinensis under the protection of the Praetorian prefect, Silvanus. Silvanus had ordered Posthumus to hand over booty that Posthumus's troops had seized from a Frankish warband, which had been on its way home from a successful raid into Gaul. However, Posthumus's men took violent exception to this attempt to enforce the rights of the representative of a distant emperor, who was manifestly failing in his duty to protect the Gallic provinces, and proclaimed Posthumus emperor, and he laid siege to Colonia Agrippinensis. Saloninus and Silvanus were soon handed over to Posthumus and killed. This was the state of the empire in the summer of 260. Gallienus's father had been captured by the Persians, Italy was invaded, Gaul and Spain were ravaged by Frankish raids, and Gallienus' second son had been murdered by a usurper in Gaul. Another perceived issue, according to Gallienus, was the independence shown by the Senate in the defence of Italy, and, to be fair, the Senate had bypassed the authority of the Praetorian Prefect and the Urban Prefect, the two offices who wielded military authority in the capital. This was the empire Gallienus inherited as sole emperor. The many usurpers that sprung up naturally had their own allies in the senate. Gallienus no doubt remembered when the senate appointed their own emperors to oppose Maximinus Thrax. Gallienus abolished the offices of Legate Legionis and Tribunus Laticlavius. The senators could no longer be involved in the army unless appointed by the emperor. To raise a revolt against the emperor was a costly business loyalties needed to be secured by large amounts of bribes and donatives, and the senators were some of the richest members of the empire. Gallienus's goal in abolishing these offices was no doubt to exclude the rich senators, the ones with the means to raise a revolt, from the army. These posts would now be filled by career soldiers who had a chance to rise through the ranks, instead of inexperienced senators. He also removed many senators from governorships around the provinces, people he felt he could no longer trust. All these measures no doubt made Gallienus one of the most hated emperors. 
He maintained his older practice of appointing a dux, who was in charge of a longer section of the frontier, to better protect the empire. Gallienus is described as exceptionally ruthless towards suspected plotters. According to Ammianus Marcellus, he used torture against any real or imagined conspirator. It's probably around this time Gallienus ends the prosecutions of Christians initiated by his father. The Gallic Empire With a usurper in Gaul, Gallienus tried to cross the Alps in 261, but was defeated and forced to retreat. As a result of this defeat, Spain and Britain declared for Posthumus. Gallienus then sent a letter to Posthumus, challenging him to single combat to prevent further loss of Roman lives. Posthumus answered that he was not a gladiator and did not intend to become one. Gallienus had won great fame for his personal combat skills and often led his men at the head of his cavalry. His personal challenge to Posthumus shows that he was confident that he would defeat Posthumus in a duel. We don't know how or where, but Gallienus managed to force his way into Gaul, perhaps going through Raetia. And in the second battle, he was able to defeat Posthumus's army and sent his cavalry under the command of Aureolus in pursuit, but evidently failed to secure a final victory over Posthumus, who was able to retreat and found refuge inside the walls of a city. During the subsequent siege, Gallienus was struck by an arrow. Meanwhile, in the east, Macrianus had declared himself emperor in the power vacuum left following Valerian's capture, and with the Persians driven out of Roman territory, he turned his gaze towards Gallienus and the west to secure his position. He was poised to cross into the Balkans in the spring of 261, and the Goths were raiding Moesia, thrice even into Macedonia itself, laying siege to Thessalonica. And with some of the Rhine forces now fighting their own emperor, Instead of defending the frontier, the Franks once again raided Roman land. In a calculated move, Gallienus decided to leave Posthumus with the defence of Gaul, while he turned his attention to dealing with Macrianus and the Goths in the Balkans. Gallienus realised that a siege would take time, but every day that passed put Macrianus closer to Italy and Rome, where he could secure his imperial position. Gallienus had been wounded during the siege. The wound was apparently so severe that he could not lead the campaign against Macrianus in person. Aureolus was put in charge of operations, while Gallienus stayed in Italy and recovered. But it's probably now that forces get permanently stationed in northern Italy to prevent any future raid deep into the peninsula. Another commander was put in charge of the war against the Goths in the Balkans. This commander was, confusingly, also named Macrianus as the usurper. Aureolus led an army that consisted of mainly mounted units, and Macrianus' forces were mainly heavy infantry. As a result of this mismatch, Aureolus was able to surround Macrianus' army, who surrendered before too many were killed. But as usual during Gallienus' reign, with one crisis dealt with, two new arises. Aureolus was proclaimed emperor, and so too was the prefect in Egypt, Emilianus, threatening the grain supply that fed Rome. Gallienus quickly sent Theodotus with a fleet to recapture Egypt. This was of paramount importance, as Rome would starve without the grain from Egypt. Luckily for Gallienus, Emilianus seems to have been preoccupied in the south when Theodotus landed. Emilianus was defeated in a pitched battle and subsequently captured and sent to Gallienus alive, who had him strangled in prison. The Emperor had apparently recovered from his wound well enough to deal with Aureolus in person. The Pretender had made his way to Pannonia. Exactly what happened next is frustratingly vague, but it appears that Aureolus was able to surrender to Gallienus before any major battle took place, and that Aureolus was once again by the Emperor's side and accompanied the Emperor in his next campaign against Posthumus. And with the Balkans under control, the Goths retreating, Egypt retaken and the east handled by Odinathus, Gallienus was free to focus on Posthumus once again. However, the war against Posthumus dragged out for a long time, and after several sieges and battles with various outcomes, it appears that Gallienus had the upper hand. But once again Gallienus failed to win the campaign before he was needed elsewhere in the empire. Posthumus was likely dragging out the war by refusing to engage in a decisive battle, 
knowing that Gallienus was likely needed some other place in the Empire soon, and Posthumus, in sharp contrast to all other usurpers, seems to have been content in staying in Gaul. The details are scarce, but it appears that the city of Byzantium refused to acknowledge Gallienus's authority and refused to cooperate with Gallienus's commander, Macrianus, who recently defeated the Goths that had now fled across to Asia Minor. Macrianus, however, was enabled to pursue them and cross the straits with the fleet and troops in Byzantium in open rebellion. Gallienus marched towards Byzantium immediately and laid siege to the city. With its naturally advantageous position, he was perhaps expecting a longer and drawn-out siege. But the very next day, they opened their gates to the Emperor and surrendered, perhaps hoping for clemency. If so, they would be disappointed. Gallienus' soldiers surrounded the disarmed troops and had them all killed and let his soldiers pillage the city. Macrianus was able to cross the straits into Asia Minor, and some of the Goths seemed to have retreated home upon his arrival in Anatolia. Magnus et Invictus With Byzantium dealt with, Gallienus hastened to Rome to celebrate his coming tenth year on the throne. In 263, a massive triumphal procession that included soldiers, gladiators, prisoners, slaves and elephants marched through the city in celebration of his decennial celebration. Persian captives had been sent by Odinathus to be used in the procession. Some of the crowd jested and searched by the Persians if they could find Emperor Valerian. This aroused anger in Gallienus who ordered that the jesters be burnt alive. If this anecdote is accurate or not is impossible to know, but Gallienus clearly had a bad conscience because he had done nothing to help his captured father, a fact that he received a lot of critique over. Following his decennial celebration, yet another usurper arose in the Balkans. The details are once again scarce, but he was probably named Saturninus. Fortunately for Gallienus, his rebellion proved short-lived, as he was soon killed by some of his own soldiers. But unfortunately, we do not know where Gallienus was for the remainder of 263. He might have returned to the Balkans or continued the war against Posthumus. And it appears certain that the war in Gaul did continue in some form in 263. But we don't know if Gallienus led the effort in person. What is known is that Gallienus was visiting Athens in 264, while fighting was still taking place in Asia Minor against the Goths. Naturally, this caused resentment among the more conservative-minded individuals, and especially among the soldiery and his recent treacherous behaviour in Byzantium. In fact, the troops in Asia were rebellious, and at first Gallienus tried to bribe the soldiers, but they distrusted him because of his previous behaviour in Byzantium and refused to be bribed. So Gallienus put them all to death for their disloyal conduct. In fact, Gallienus was to become very harsh towards anyone who opposed his rule. In 264, he returned to Rome, where he assumed the well-earned title of Magnus et Invictus, the Great and Invincible. While emperors often received ill-deserved titles, no one can argue that this was a mere platitude. He had indeed won all his battles, and considering the many setbacks he had overcome, he can easily be regarded as great. Around the same time, in 264, another usurper proclaimed himself emperor, this time in Africa, Celsus. However, his stint as a pretender lasted for only seven days. He was apparently killed by Galliena, who might have been a cousin to Gallienus. If this Galliena was a cousin to the emperor, it's likely that she was accompanied by his frumentarii that could dispatch the problem quickly. For the following year, 265, our sources do not give any details, so it has been considered Gallienus's rest year which he probably spent in Rome. Gallienus was a very cultured man, who was well versed in the study of history and especially Greek culture. He probably spent the year enjoying his artistic tendencies. He had spent his years on the throne on the field of battle, so many of his companions were soldiers who disapproved of the emperor's upper-class habits. He probably started the massive building project in Rome during this year, a massive statue of himself as Sol Invictus, on the Esquiline Hill. It was set to be twice as big as the famous Colossus outside the Flavian Amphitheatre. The project was likely cancelled under Emperor Aurelian. 
Gallienus also spent the year planning for his upcoming campaign against Postumus once again. He strengthened the borders and rebuilt the fences. We know that Verona received its walls at this time, protecting northern Italy from incursions through the Brenner Pass. The Gothic War In the following year, 266, Odinathus led another invasion of Sassanid Persia and eventually even captured the important city of Stasiphon in 266 or 267, but was forced to abandon his campaign when the Goths once again raided Anatolia. But Odinathus would never fight against the Goths. Either they retreated before he arrived, or he was assassinated before he could take any action. Our sources differ on the account. But it's clear that Odinathus was killed for reasons unknown. Perhaps his wife Zenobia had him killed to promote her own sons to succeed him. It seems unlikely that Gallienus had anything to do with the murder, as by all accounts, it seems Odinathus was loyal to the emperor. Either way, it's clear that Zenobia and Gallienus had amicable relations, and the Palmyrenes did not engage in hostilities during Gallienus' reign. The Goths had taken to their ships and tried to retreat back to their lands, but were engaged by a Roman fleet that inflicted a crushing defeat on the retreating forces. Some, if not most, of the Goths were able to return home, which seems to have encouraged a mass migration into Roman territory. All the sources agree that the fighting force of this migration consisted of 320,000 fighting men. It consisted of many Gothic, Celtic, and Germanic tribes that had merged together and now advanced south along the western coast of the Black Sea. They tried and failed to capture the walled city of Thomas and were repulsed from Marcianopolis. When they tried to capture Byzantium, their navy was defeated, and without the naval advantage, a siege against Byzantium was hopeless. So the Goths, with whatever ships they could muster, sailed across the Sea of Mamara and attacked Sisychus where they once again lost to the superior Roman navy. Sometime in 267, Gallienus was on his way to the region, having understood the magnitude of the force. This was no simple raid, it was a mass migration. He left Aureolus in charge of containing Postumus and protecting Italy with his base in Mediolanum. This was the same Aureolus that had revolted against Gallienus back in 261, Aureolus had by now re-won Gallienus' trust, a trust that was ultimately misplaced, as we will see. The Goths sailed towards Mount Athos in northern Greece, where they were able to lick their wounds and repair their ships. The Goths divided their forces, one fleet going south with around 500 ships with the Heruli tribe. They raided many small islands on their way towards Attica, where they put Athens to the torch. We know that Heruli was defeated following the sack of Athens by a small band of Athenian militia, but it is unclear what happened to the entire Heruli force after that. But we know that the Heruli chieftain would later unconditionally surrender to Gallienus, whom he raised to the rank of consul. Honouring a barbarian that had just ravaged Roman land must have angered some of his generals. Meanwhile, the other division was laying siege to Thessalonica, and was close to taking the city when they learned that the emperor was approaching in haste. Gallienus had probably taken the land route at the head of his elite cavalry, together with his second-in-command, Claudius. They were advancing from the north, and the armies met at Nasus. The fighting began with the Roman cavalry charging the Goths, and then feigning a retreat. The pursuing Gothic cavalry was led into an ambush, and 50,000 Gothic horsemen were slaughtered. The Gothic infantry had constructed a wagon fort and refused to come out following the defeat of their cavalry. They moved south again into Macedonia. It's clear that the Goths were suffering from food shortages at this time. Their campaign had clearly not gone as they had expected. They had failed to capture any cities and were defeated on multiple fronts. Their force was massive, but it's clear that the Goths were disunited, lacking the necessary training in combined operations between all the separate tribes. The Roman cavalry was harassing the retreating Goths that changed course and headed for the Hamus Mountains between Thrace and Moesia, where they would be safe from the Roman cavalry attacks in the mountains. Gallienus continually harassed the retreating Goths, and at the Hamus, the Goths offered battle once again. This time the Roman infantry led the attack, likely because the Goths were seeking protection from their wagon fort. 
against which the Roman cavalry would prove ineffective. The Roman infantry was pushed back by the Goths, and only then was the cavalry sent in to cover the retreat of the infantry. But apparently, the cavalry had some success in pushing the Goths back, and even into their camp, where they proceeded to plunder the camp, because they thought the victory was complete. But the Goths soon regrouped, and Rome lost 2,000 horsemen as a result of this blunder. It's likely Claudius was the commander who led the cavalry at this engagement. The cavalry had saved the day, but also overextended and suffered a defeat. Following this mixed battle, Gallienus received the news that Aureolus had revolted in Italy and was preparing a march on Rome. So he left Macrianus in charge of the continuation of the Gothic War as he hastened back to Italy. Aureolus had declared for Posthumus, and it appears that he had transferred the troops from Raetia into Mediolanum, leaving the northern frontier weakened. The speed at which Gallienus seems to have acted baffled Aureolus, who had not even left Mediolanum before the emperor arrived in northern Italy at the head of his feared elite cavalry, and Gallienus defeated Aureolus at the Battle of the Pontirolo Bridge outside the city. But Aureolus survived the battle and retreated behind the walls of Mediolanum, and the emperor prepared for a siege. During the siege, it's reported that the enemy noted that Gallienus was in the habit of leaving too few soldiers behind in the camp to protect his wife, Salonina. Their plan was to capture the empress, presumably for the purpose of using her as a hostage. But luckily for her and Gallienus, there was a soldier in front of her tent who was adjusting his sandal when the enemy appeared. He grabbed his shield and a dagger, killed two of them, and held the rest in check until help arrived. The Conspiracy In the late summer of 268, Gallienus was enjoying a meal when he received a report that Aureolus was approaching. He quickly jumped on his horse and rode off. A troop of horsemen blocked his route, and Gallienus asked what they wanted. They answered they wanted to remove him from office. Gallienus tried to flee, but when his horse balked at the edge of a stream, his pursuers caught up to him and threw a spear at him. Gallienus fell from his horse and soon died from blood loss. That's one version of the events, but there are many more. Some rumours were circulating that Gallienus was planning to have a number of generals killed. This is based off a forged list made by Aureolus. It seems that either Aurelian, not to be confused with Aureolus, or Claudius was the mastermind behind this conspiracy. Heraclianus, the Praetorian Prefect, is also mentioned as a potential suspect. What is clear is that Gallienus was murdered by his own generals towards the end of the summer of 268. Gallienus's trusted commander Claudius was proclaimed Emperor of Rome. Final Thoughts Gallienus was, in many respects, his father's opposite. Valerian was ultra-conservative with traditional senatorial values, but Gallienus proved to be an innovator who tried new things and established new creative ideas to better protect the empire. His new mobile cavalry army was far better suited for dealing with incursions inside Roman territory. He married a barbarian woman to secure an alliance and stabilize a frontier region of the empire. He diminished the military power of the Senate, which would ultimately reduce the risk of further usurpation. During the prior century, the border provinces had been divided to reduce the military power a single governor had. That was a good decision when Rome's neighbours were weak and friendly. His use of a dux with the overall command of an entire frontier was needed now when Rome faced stronger and more aggressive neighbours. But the sheer number and scale of the incursions were unprecedented, and the frontiers had been severely weakened in recent years owing to the many civil wars that had ravaged the empire, followed by pestilence that diminished Roman manpower and economy. But ultimately, Gallienus could not be everywhere at once to plug the holes in the frontiers. His genius idea of using a new cavalry corps to respond to incursions quickly proved to be a long-lasting military doctrine on the Empire's frontiers and a key element to his numerous triumphs. But it seems clear to me that Gallienus did not have a master plan to save the Empire from the crisis of the 3rd century. Instead, many of his reforms were ad hoc emergency measures. 
Gallienus proved to be the man the Empire needed at the time. He had the mental capacity to cope, improvise and adapt to the given situation, and in my estimation, he was one of the best emperors of Rome. With a lesser man, the Empire could have fractured even more. Or even dissolved. Thanks for watching the video. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we make here on the channel. It really helps us grow and reach more people. Check out our previous video on Valerian if you haven't seen it. The next video in this series will be on Claudius.